All right, so this lesson is entitled European Transformations 1. And in this lesson, we're going to focus on the explorers, particularly the Iberian explorers, Columbus and da Gama, and also a little bit of Northwestern European exploration. And so one of the big changes that enabled um, the Iberians particularly Spain and Portugal, to um, start to explore and expand European power into the Atlantic and across the Atlantic to the Americas, as well as south into Africa, around Africa, and into the Indian Ocean, um, was this European technological synthesis. Now, when we say synthesis, what we mean is we take bits and pieces from all over the place and glue them together to make something new and awesome, right? And, and that's really what the Europeans were doing, right? In the late, late 1400s, the Renaissance is gathering momentum in Europe. It's this time of the rebirth of learning, right? Europe is coming out of the Dark Ages and, um, you know, Europeans are starting to read Latin and Greek more commonly, and so the Roman and Greek learning is starting to uh, come back into European science and European thought, and also the Europeans are learning things from the Arabs and the Chinese and the Indians as well. And so one of the big changes uh, was that the Europeans improved um, their ship design. And like I said, they gained technological knowledge or STEM knowledge from the Arabs, particularly improved sail designs and mathematics. From the Chinese, they get the compasses and map making technology and gunpowder. And like I said, from the Greeks and Romans, scientific works are coming in from the older Hellenistic world, sometimes as far away as Persia and uh, Western India, and then they're being retranslated into languages that the Europeans understand. So it's all these things coming together um, to really give Europe a, a real technological boost. It's also at this time period, specifically 1492, I mean, we think of 1492 as the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. This was also a very important year because it was the year uh, that the Reconquista ended, right? Reconquista is a Spanish word that just means to reconquer. Right in 1492, the last Muslims are pushed out of the Iberian Peninsula, and the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon, which are older Spanish kingdoms, are united in the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella. Portugal has also become very strong and independent, and you know the I the Iberians are in an ideal location for exploration to the south into Africa. I mean, you remember how close. Northwestern Africa is to southwestern Europe. Um, you, know, you could almost swim there. Um, you know, it's a, they have warm water ports. They don't have to worry about you know some of the colder weather that the the Danes and the Scots have to deal with. And um, you know, so they're in a great position to to go exploring. And so, of course, the most famous of the Iberian explorers. He's actually a Genoese. Uh, you know, so Christopher Columbus was actually Italian. He wasn't Spanish, even though he worked for Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. Uh, and he had maps of India, right? I mean, this is one of the interesting, um, the interesting mistakes that a lot of students bring with them into world history. You know, they think, oh, well, you know, Columbus went west because, um, you know, that was, you know, he wanted to find India. He knew how to get to India. Um, the problem was, as we saw in the first lesson in this project, that you know he has the Mongols and the Ottomans in his way. I mean, Columbus could have walked to India. He knew how to get there. Um, and he knew what the Far East looked like in terms of geography and maps. Um, you know, so he took a gamble. He tried to go west. And of course, he landed on the island of Hispaniola which is the island that has the modern nations of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Um, mo I find that most students don't know much about Vasco da Gama, and, and you really should. I mean, we tend to focus on Columbus here in the United States because, of course, he discovered, not discovered, but he was the first you know European to, that we know of to reach North America and South America. 
Uh, you know, so in, in the Americas, we're, you know, I think naturally more interested in Columbus, but Vasco da Gama may have been the more important explorer, and he was a Portuguese man. Um, he was the first European to sail around the Cape of Good Hope, which is the tip of southern Africa, and out into the Indian Ocean. Um, and he had huge effects on the history of East Africa and India. I mean, he was a ruthless naval commander. Um, you know, we have historical accounts of him seriously just sailing up to cities and, and, and attacking them. Not really, no, hi, how you doing, but, you know, just coming in and going to work. Um, you know, and he reached as far away as India. You see the map here of his um, voyages. He made it all the way to Calicut and the western coast of India. So in terms of distance and connecting cultures and connecting a variety of civilizations, like I said, Vasco da Gama may have been the more important and influential explorer. Another major explorer was Ferdinand Magellan, and he was a Spaniard, uh, and the first explorer to sail around the world. Um, actually, I don't think he made it, but his ships were the first ships to make it all the way around the world. And he's important because he connects Spanish power to the Indian Ocean and even the Pacific. Um, right, the Philippines are named after King Philip of Spain. Uh, it was Magellan who established some of those claims over uh, the Philippines and um, the western coast of South America. So uh, another very important explorer who, like I said, you know, as I said a moment ago, you know, American kids, we just focus on Columbus, but Magellan had a huge impact as well. The Northwestern European nations, you know, Denmark, um, England, France, also explored, but they were the latecomers. They started later, they did less, um, their early colonies weren't as profitable. Right? I mean, we think about the United States as being so rich and powerful, but, you know, England didn't necessarily get the best colonies early on you know, Mexico and Peru, as we're going to see, much more valuable and um, profitable in the early part of the European exploration period than, you know, a bunch of timberland in Maine. Um, but, you know, English exploration was led by John Cabot and Henry Hudson, and they primarily explored Canada. Um, not early on, not as much exploration of what is now the United States. In fact, you know, most of the United States was actually explored by France. Um, guys like uh, Jacques Cartier and René Robert Cavalier and Sierra de la Salle, who explored regions that are now, you know, France, I mean, that's Quebec, but also the lower Mississippi and up the Mississippi. If you recall back to, you know, your American history class from eighth grade, you know, we buy, you know, the Americans bought a lot of the United States from France. Um, and like I said, later explorations, um, they had less drive, um, and they also faced a lot of climate and geographic challenges. It was much harder to do business in what is now the Can Canada and the United States than you know further south in nice, warm, tropical places like Mexico. <clears throat> so let's return to you know our focus on the Iberians, particularly Spain and, and Portugal, and and here you know we're looking at the Colombian exchange named after Christopher Columbus, um, and this was a, a big change in world history. And if you're interested, <coughs> excuse me, in ecology and life sciences, you know the Colombian exchange is very important in the history of those sciences because many crops and animals and diseases were exchanged, right? We look at, you know, the New World has, you know, these food products like corn and potatoes and beans and cocoa beans. It's kind of interesting to think about, and coffee as well. It's kind of interesting to think of Europe without chocolate or coffee, but they didn't have those things before Columbus and, and the contact between the Old World and the New World. Also precious metals like gold and silver, as we're going to see in our DBQ, uh, very important in the Colombian exchange. The Old World sends food products like wheat and sugar and rice. Um, oh, coffee beans. Uh, actually an Old World crop, I'm sorry. Horses as well, right? I mean, we think about Indians, n Indians from you know, native, you know, Native Americans. We think of Native Americans as riding horses, but you know they didn't do that before 
uh, the Europeans came, the the Europeans also brought a lot of diseases like smallpox and measles, influenza and typhus. And as we're going to see in um, our DBQ on Latin America, that had a, a major change, major impact on um, Native American populations. And so the connection of Europe to North America and South America, as well as Africa, started this process of what we call a world system. Right? And the world system is a theory uh, developed pe by people like Emmanuel Wallerstein, who have this idea of the world system. And this is primarily an economic system, but it's also a military and political system as well, of what we call core states and periphery states. And core states are militarily powerful, they have high technology, um, you know, they import raw materials from the periphery, and they export f finished goods. So what this might look like is you have timber coming from North America going into Europe and becoming furniture that Europeans then sell furniture back to North America or Africa or some other part of the world or within Europe itself. Um, the periphery is States have little military power and little or no technology, uh, little or no advanced technology, I think would probably be a better way of putting it. Um, you know, and so they export the raw materials and they also provide cheap labor, right? So if you think of, you know, the plantation economies of the Caribbean, you know, the raw material is sugar and the cheap labor is either low paid, low skilled workers or slaves, as we're going to see in this project. And so, you know, the Iberians get their colonies, right? Remember that Spain gets, um, you know, the Caribbean and Florida and Mexico and Central America and parts of Northwestern South America and the Philippines. And, and Portugal gets Brazil. Um, but they also get some colonies in the Old World, right? Goa and Macau. These are India and China, respectively, also trade stations throughout East Africa and the Indian Ocean. Right, so Portugal's colonies much more spread out than Spain's. Um, part of this had to do with the Treaty of Tordesillas. Um, the Pope declares that, um, you know, west of the Treaty of Tordesillas line, those are Spanish colonies, and east of the Treaty of Tordesillas line, those are Brazilian colonies. Kind of a strange concept, right, for the Pope in Rome to declare, you know, that these Native American lands be given to these people or those people. Um, really a strange concept. Um, but, you know, Spain and Portugal had the military power to enforce their will upon Native Americans. And, you know, the Pope, Pope could sign off on that. So we look now at the North American colonies. Um, and you see, right, I mean, France really was the leader in colonial exploration, right? I think, you know, as Americans, we grow up studying the British and thinking about British colonies and the Revolutionary War and that part of our history. Um, but, you know, we would do well to remember that early on, France had much more territory and much more powerful. <coughs> Excuse me, there was a small Dutch presence in uh, New York. Um, and then the Dutch also developed, you know, power and colonies in India and Southeast Asia as well. Um, but, you know, if we look at the North American colonies, there they are. Right, and so big changes in the world map, right? If you remember back to the project launch video that you watched, I pointed out that in 1000 CE, um, Europe was this kind of small, dirty, weak, backwards place. By 1660, you can see that Europeans have, you know, big control over, you know, almost the whole world. I mean, not everywhere in the world, but, you know, if you spread it out, Europeans have colonies just about everywhere. Um, and this is going to be a big change that we're going to look at throughout this project and the next project. Um, project six will be about Europe starting to lose control of the world. Um, but we're looking at the beginning here of a world system that would define history for 500 years. 
one of the one of the byproducts of European exploration and expansion and colonization were idea the ideas of mercantilism and early car corporations and pirates. I mean, this is also the era of the pirates, you know, with the peg legs and the parrots and the you know black beard and things like that. Um, and part of this comes out of the mercantilism idea. <clears throat> mercantilism is a political idea that government is really there to improve the economy and they do that by lowering taxes and encouraging exports and by controlling or expanding trade routes. This was also a period in which we start to get corporations, people basically putting their money together like hey let's all put in a thousand dollars into this company and if it makes profits we'll divide the profits and if it loses money well then you know that was a bad investment and so we start to get some of these early corporations like the Dutch East India and British East India Company um, and they're gonna have big influence as we're gonna see in project five so we want to keep an eye on them and yeah like I said I mean under this mercantilist idea um, pirates were all over the place. In fact, so a lot of pirates worked for governments. You know, England had a lot of pirates that worked for them, and they, you know, basically the idea was was, you know, you go out there in the Atlantic Ocean and steal from the Spanish, give a twenty percent cut to the government, and then keep the rest for yourself. Um, you know, as we're going to see in upcoming lessons, there's a lot of silver and gold and other valuable resources going across the Atlantic, and so piracy. Uh, could be a very profitable business. And so if we you know look back and you should remember this graphic from the Project 4 launch, um, we're starting to see the roots of inequality in world history, right? Europe had the ability to ship and trade and fight over long distances and so they were able to set up a system of core and periphery states and some of the early periphery states of uh, the world system would, you know, places like North America would go on to become very wealthy and powerful themselves. And it was also at this time that China actually withdrew from world exploration. Um, in the earlier 1400s, China had a much stronger navy and much greater abilities to trade and travel on the sea, but because of political um, decisions back home by the emperor, as well as pressure from the north by the Mongols, you know, China withdrew and, and stopped becoming an exploring and world conquering force. And also instabilities in the Muslim and Indian, Indian worlds, um, primarily due to the Mongols, um, kept them out of the competition too. Um, and then, you know, disease and military technology disadvantages made the American civilizations like the Inca and the Aztecs weak too. So, you know, Europe was really able to grow and become very powerful and rich at this time period because of decisions that civilizations made and because of STEM imbalances that other, uh, that existed with the American civilizations. And so we really see the roots of inequality and in wealth and political and military power start to develop as early as the early 1500s. Okay, and so that's it. Please use this background knowledge to help you make connections in your chain reactions DBQ. And remember that the theory of the world system explains a lot about the world economy in our day and age too.